Welcome back to Season 3, Episode 2 of the Pro-Aging Podcast. And today we are talking breast in show. And we are talking with Dr. Dan Maman, famous breast in surgeon. And we're calling this one Breast in Show. This guy's got a resume from around the world. He's got a business degree. He's Harvard trained. He trained in New York City. And he's really one of the most premier breast surgeons in the world. We're going to get a history lesson. We're going to find out what's to come and really what are the best techniques to educate people who are interested in breast surgery. So I'm excited to listen to it. I hope you are too. Always going to be somebody. You are putting a foreign object in, in somebody's body. There are people who swear that when they take out their implants, there's something about their physiology that feels better. Do you believe that there's a small percentage of people that may be just reactive to having a foreign body in them? I mean, look, it's it's certainly possible. It's certainly yeah. something that we study a lot. We talk about a lot. We think about, there is a phenomenon uh, on social media called breast implant illness. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of that. I've heard of this. Uh, it's essentially a constellation of about 150 vague symptoms ranging from insomnia to chronic fatigue, rashes to dry skin, yeah. headaches to dizziness, et cetera, uh, which uh, this very vocal group of women online, several thousand women, attribute those symptoms to their breast implants. Yeah. And uh, that's come to light in the last few years. And there's been some extensive sort of exploration of that by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons and, and others. Uh, and we've struggled to find a direct link Right. Between those symptoms and breast yeah. implants. Yeah. I mean, and anything's possible. You're putting something far. And we hear about this with fillers, with threads, with everything. I mean, listen, this always could be a small, but right. the question is, is there enough of a risk that you would give a recommendation one way or the right. other? Now, regarding the, the replacement of implants, you know, I don't know. I always kind of felt that a lot of people get breast implants, and even though they're told that they need to be replaced, that probably a lot of people don't get them replaced. What percentage of women actually you think stick with the recommendations on replacement over the years? Well, first of all, I think there's a common myth that breast implants have to be exchanged every 10 years. Oh, I mean, it, that, it, that's not true. That's not true. Definitely not true. But there are women that show up in my office and say, you know, either I did it or some other surgeon did it. Yeah. And I'm on 10 years and three days and I'm here because I need my implants replaced. Yeah. It's just not true. The truth is, if there's not a problem, you really don't have to mess I mean, with you have people that have had breast implants for 40 years? Right. I operated on a woman this morning who had her breast augmentation in 1992. Wow. And Why'd she have the surgery? Because she had imaging that suggested rupture. Uh -huh. I went in there and actually both were intact. That's, that's unusual. Uh, but women walk around with breast implants for 30 years. The bottom line is most of the studies show a mean survival of about 15 years. Okay. So what I always tell people, you're going to get between 10 and 30 years out of it. Do you recommend for people to get MRI? So, I mean, the FDA recommendation is to evaluate the implants every three to five years with an MRI. I don't really know very many people that get it. Yeah. But most of the women that we operate on are uh, you know, in their 30s, close to, or 40s, close to breast cancer uh, imaging protocols. Age, right, age. exactly. So... You know, at least somebody's imaging their breasts on an annual basis, and we have a good indication as to whether right. there's something wrong with the implants or not. So in these days, because I, I get, listen, I think all forms of cosmetic surgery are uh, much more accessible to people. Um, there's much less stereotype. They're much more acceptable uh, in society. Uh, this also comes with access and the frequency and the number of cases formed. This also comes more challenging type cases, right? People have maybe had bad work. People have complicated physiologies, other things going on. What do you find most challenging in your daily practice surgically? And um, is it something you enjoy dealing with? Or you can give me some of the pros and cons here. I think it's probably not so dissimilar to the answer that you would give, and you'll t you'll tell me if it's true. <laughs> Setting patient expectations. Yeah, it's always. Uh, I mean, there there are women that come in that are extraordinarily realistic. They understand their breasts look a certain way. I'm gonna make them a better versions of, the, of themselves, yeah. but they're not gonna be model esque, and their breasts are not gonna look like they're 18 yeah. again. And then there are other women that come in and are totally unrealistic, and it's either my job to recalibrate that yeah. expectation yeah. or to decide, hey, maybe this yeah. is someone that we shouldn't operate. I mean, there's certain, you know, I always say with certain things, like you can't put a size four foot in a size three shoe when people want their, right. they come in for lips. 
they show me a picture of someone's lips. I'm sure it's the same way. I'm like, listen, I could augment your lip. Yeah. I could enhance certain things. I could do things. But I can't fit a size four foot in a size three shoe. I can't change the shape that dramatically. And I'm sure it's similar. Oh, 100%. You know? I have hundreds of before and after pictures that I show uh, in the office during the consult. And I have every single body type, every single breast type on those images. And I'll scroll through and I'll only show people the pictures that are relevant to yeah. them. Uh, and they'll always go back. Oh, can you show me case twenty two? Like, well, that doesn't look anything like you. Yeah. So we're gonna skip. We're gonna skip that picture. Um, I bet you. I know because people ask me this. I mean, it's as long as I've been practicing, they're asking about. You know, they want filler in the breast. They want fat in their breast. You know, the people still have this adverse feeling. They understandably, some people don't want to put a foreign object in the body. As a liposuction surgeon, does doing a lot of fat transfer. I, in general, recommend against it unless they have like a lumpectomy scar or something very finite, mm -hmm. um, mostly because I don't want to mess with breast tissue, right? I don't want to increase yeah. scar tissue to affect uh, mammography, MRI, or anything like that. Um, and it, fat could be very unpredictable. Are there any periods where you use fat in your breast augmentation surgery? So I feel very similar to what you just said. Yeah. Uh, it is injecting fat into someone's breast is certainly an acceptable treatment. Yeah. Uh, there are some people that do it. People as like do it routinely. Yeah. It's talked about at our meetings. Uh, it is not frowned upon in any way. Yeah. I am not a believer in it. I yeah. wouldn't do it in my wife, and hence I don't do it in any of my yeah. patients. Yeah. And for the exact same reasons that you that you stated. Yeah. Uh, the biggest one is disruption of mammography. It yeah. just muddies the water. Yes. Most good mammographers can tell the difference in calcification patterns uh, from fat that has died or what we call necrosis. Yeah. Uh, but you know, sometimes there are calcification patterns that overlap. Yeah. Uh, and in our society, where so many people are risk averse, and there's such high uh, uh, anxiety associated with breast imaging. If, if a breast radiologist tells you you've got, look, you've got some calcifications, it's probably from the fat grafting. If you want to be 100% sure, we can biopsy it. Otherwise, you can come back in six months. No. Most of the women that I know are yeah. going to say, just go ahead and biopsy yeah. it. Well, I'm, I'm assuming because there are some women that need fat are almost around certain areas to take away certain... Uh, can you use fat around an implant or in areas where skin is thin or tight? Um is there any use, not for volume, but to make the appearance of it look better? Because I do see women where they have certain like concavities of their chest and things like that, where they're asking, and I've used filler. I've used filler in women that have had breast implants to fill in areas a little different, uh, divots where they don't want to go to augmentation. Do you see that? For sure. I mean, we can, enjoy, like you said, it, women that have, that are thin, prominent uh, yeah. ribs, uh, implants that are maybe on the big side or of a high profile variety where there's a big transition or shelf in the superior part of the breast, yeah. we can fan that area or smooth that area out with fat. But I have a very serious conversation about the pros and cons yeah. of doing that yeah. uh, and whether they want to assume the risks. Do So correct me if I'm wrong, but back in the early days, there were a lot of implants that were above the muscle. Was that a common thing as yeah. opposed to underneath the muscle? I mean, we... It's still done both ways. It is done it is both still ways. Definitely Tell me a little ways. bit about the differences for the audience. I put 99% of the implants I put in are below the muscle. That's what I figured. Uh, above the muscle. So pros of the above the muscle. Easier surgery. You're essentially tucking an implant below the skin. So easier surgery, uh, much less technically demanding for the surgeon, uh, much easier recovery. Really? So Again, you're tucking something under the yeah. skin. You're not cutting any muscles. You're not lifting any muscles. You're not restricting their exercise. Because like your dermatologists do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in fact, many of the augmentations in the country that are done above the muscle are not done by board-certified plastic surgeons, yeah, but they're yeah. done by other yeah, yeah. Uh, surgeons of other varieties. How are they aesthetically? Uh, some of them can look okay. Depends on the soft tissue coverage over the implant, yeah. meaning how thick is the, the skin dermis, and the fat yeah. over the implant. Uh, but in general... They, they can look like you have an orange stuck to your chest. Yeah. yeah. And for that reason, uh, I, my preference is to go below the muscle. Yeah. Is there any reason medically or in a case that would you would want to do something above? I mean, in the rare case where, I'm trying to think of the last case that I did, uh, where I had a, a serious college level bodybuilder, a woman that was bench pressing and bodybuilding. And whenever you place an implant below the muscle, I am cutting some muscle fibers, yeah. but in normal people like you, right. no, there's like, no discernible difference. Yeah, Even yeah. really good athletes, tennis players, golfers, really? 
there's no discernible difference. But you can imagine if you were operating on an Olympic swimmer. Oh, yeah. And you cut some pectoralis muscle fibers and you change their their time by 0.2 seconds, it's significant. I would think maybe they should just not get surgery for a while. To right. I, I, I would agree. Yeah, you, know, you know what I mean? Um, you know, let's talk about the look. You know, I think, and I see this in my field too, like everyone says they want natural. We know that. Mm -hmm. And I always say, if you really wanted natural, we'd all be walking around looking like the walking dead, not brushing our <laughs> teeth, using deodorant, putting dye in our hair, putting on makeup, all these things. What people mean is they, they, they don't want to look obvious. That's what I think they mean when right. they say natural looking. But we know that there are plenty of women, just like in my field, are walking around with huge lips thinking they look natural. Breasts can be a a sign of obviousness of cosmetic opportunity. How do you deal with that in your practice? Do you think there's a trend? Are people getting better at having appropriate expectations of the natural look? When we do surgery, plastic surgery, we are permanently altering the body. Yeah. To operate based on a trend, I mean, is a terrible idea. That's true. But uh, that doesn't mean people don't want these things. I agree. I agree. Uh, but it's my job to either yeah. advise them otherwise, uh, yeah. but it's also my principle. I just don't operate on trends. You know, for example, uh, lips, for example. Yeah. Some people like big lips, some don't. You're going to use your aesthetic judgment yeah. to address that, but in the worst case scenario, it's gone in six yeah. months. They may not. They may never do it again, or yeah. it's reversible. Yeah. Uh, surgery is just not reversible. It's just not reversible. And we're seeing that in the BBL uh, oh, yeah. space. Yes. Right? People that had huge... Uh, BBL Brazilian butt lifts where enormous amounts of fat or implants were put into their buttocks over the last decade. And now people are talking about reversals. You almost never hear people talking about BBL. Well, wow. that must be tough to do because uh, the tissue is very stretched. Oh, I mean, this same thing with breasts. I mean, there are a lot of women who probably had much larger breasts younger and now they want something smaller. How do you do? You have to do like a lift of some right. sort, right? So, for sure. So I think historically, when we talk about breast augmentation, we think back to the 80s and 90s, yeah. where when you go to Miami Beach and you're sitting on the beach and you see a woman that walks by with breast implants, that augmented look was perceived as sexy. People like that look. Yeah. Uh, I think today's breast augmentation is a lot more discreet. Good. I always tell I always tell people my objective is to make you have really nice breasts, but nobody should know right. from conversational distance. I've, the that same you, way that you dermatologically. Have period. Yeah. Yeah, you want only you you want to look like nothing was done, exactly. but in the best of ways. Exactly. Um, and I have to assume when you're not challenging the tissue to that degree, and it's true with lips and fillers and all these things, that it's actually a safer and better procedure to perform because you're doing something that's appropriate within the the limits of physiology within their body, right? When you're trying to really push things, it could become a problem for sure. Uh, I mean, implants are extraordinarily safe in the right patient. Yeah. Uh, complication profiles way less than one percent but there is no question if you put in a reasonably sized relatively small implant the risk of complication is even far less yeah uh, and that has to do with the fact putting in big implants it stretches the skin it disrupts the overlying anatomy rippling all uh, these rippling all these other problems and i have to assume higher risk of rupture right if you does it does it increase yeah i guess if you looked at the physics behind it the yeah. bigger the mechanical device the higher the risk of implant failure but yeah. yes it makes it makes intuitive sense if you're walking around with these huge implants yeah. uh you're gonna have a lot more problems whether it's implant rupture implant failure rippling uh, extrusion or uh disruption of the yeah, yeah. skin etc cetera, etc cetera. so what is the difference i mean i assume there was like one shape and just various sizes like 20 years ago there i you hear all these things like the the teardrop the jelly the this the that the gummy like what well, give me a little background for the audience in terms of shapes and is this a new thing were they all one size fit all give me a little give me a little uh Review. So in the in the last ten to fifteen years, there's been a lot of advancements in breast implant technology. Yeah. Uh, there's a much greater variety of different implant types, shapes, sizes, textured. The bottom line is there's two main categories of implants: saline and silicone. Yeah. Right. I personally don't like using saline. Ninety nine point nine percent of the implants I put in are silicone. Yeah. Of the silicone variety, they come in smooth round, textured round, and teardrop shaped. Uh, the teardrop shaped implants had a lot of hype around them about 10 years ago when they first came to the market. It makes intuitive sense. An implant that's shaped like a teardrop should look better. And in yeah. fact, oftentimes it did look better in the breast. The problem was we found out after using them for about five years pretty extensively that there were other problems associated with them. 
Uh, first of all, the texturing has been associated with a very rare yes. uh, condition called ALCL. It's like anaplastic large cell lymphoma is what it stands yeah. for. A uh, lot of media coverage of that phenomenon. Yes. There's still less than 2,000 cases in the entire world. Why, why would someone want a textured implant? So the teardrop-shaped <clears throat> anatomic implants, you can imagine there's an axis. There's yeah. an up and there's a down. And the only way to secure it in position is to texture it because the texture acts like a Velcro uh, to prevent the implant from rotating. Even as such... The so it's a positioning thing. It's a positioning. Even as such, though, the implant did rotate once in a while. You would have to reoperate on those women to fix it. And I've seen patients where it's like twisted around. Yeah. Same thing with butt implants too. Yes. So those implants are problematic. I don't like them. Most plastic surgeons have completely abandoned okay. them. So uh, that brings us pretty much to smooth, round silicone implants. Huh. I have two implants here. I want to Let's show. take a look. I want to show you. I can't wait. Okay. Both of these implants, believe it or not, the exact same volume, 175 cc's. Oh, really? So everybody comes into the office obsessing about, I want 220 cc's. My best friend had it. Or I saw case number 92 on your website. That was 350 cc's. That's what I want. And what I always tell people is, don't worry about the volume because both of these implants are the exact same volume and I can make them look totally different in two different Really? People. So the bottom line is when you look at these two implants, this one has a wider base with lower projection. This one has a narrow base with higher projection. This one's filled to a higher fill pressure. That's why this one dimples a little bit more. And we can also change the viscosity. There's about three different types of viscosities. Uh, these are the softest, most comfortable implants. Uh, so there are a lot of variations. There's a lot of variations. Wow. And I assume it's a much longer lecture why you would choose various. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's an art and a science to it. Wow. There are certainly plenty of plastic surgeons that just have one type. They open up their cabinet in the operating room. They have every size really? from 150 to 500. How many different kinds you keep in your office? I mean, honestly, we custom order for every patient. Yeah, you custom order. Uh, and it, it has to do with soft tissue, with thickness, of course, the desired of course. result. There's a million reasons. And it's something that just with your experience, you eyeball it, you examine them, you palpate, and you're like, you just know. Because yes. people ask me, like, how do you know to use that setting or that? I'm like, you just you do just, it. You just sort of know. You just do it. And the other thing is, I don't commit to size before we go into the operating room, believe it or not. Right. I give patients a range of about three to four implants. Really? And that range is what I call the natural range, meaning any of those implants that I put in are going to give you an acceptable, reasonable, natural result. So you're ordering but, extra implants? Yeah. Believe it or not, we order about 12 to 15 implants per case. No. Yes. Because we order three of each type. In case somebody in the operating room drops them on the yeah, floor, yeah. we trash it. Uh, <laughs> and then while the patient's asleep, I sit them up. I put in the three different sizes, four different sizes. Decide what looks good. We survey the room. Sometimes we put in two different sizes on each side if someone has some baseline asymmetry. Uh, and we go from there. But I always, I always tell the women that uh, I operate on, if you trust me to put you to sleep, you're yeah. going to trust me to make a good decision on your behalf. In the yeah. Operating room. yeah. That's amazing. Um, I'm sure a lot now does the variation in sizes and viscosity and shape, all these different things, do they affect things like the scar that you have to make the incision? Cause I know when I do liposuction or I do it, how many holes, how many, this, how many, that it, it makes part of their decision-making process. How many, and I always tell them like, that's the least of the problem here. Right. We can manage all that. And that's how you and I have developed a relationship because people are going to consider scars. Does access play a role here? It's a good question. Uh, saline implants, historically, you could put in through smaller incisions yeah, yeah, because yeah. They, came, they come empty. You roll them up almost like a cigarette. You stuff them in through a small remote incision, and then you inflate them once. You once can't do that with silicone? Silicone implants are pre-filled. Yeah. Uh, so I always start with about a 3, 3.5 centimeter incision, which is between an inch and an inch and a half. Under the breast? Under, in, in the breast crease or around the nipple. I was going to say, why would want someone do a breast crease versus a nipple? It, it's complicated. Uh most women will end up with an incision in the crease of the breast. That's what I see. Some women that are really small that have tight breasts where there's no hanging of the breast, uh, I try not to put an incision in the fold because you'll always see that incision. Yeah. If the breast is not falling over the crease. Yeah. Uh, and then those incisions around the nipple can look really, really good, almost to the point where you can't see. Yeah. There are some downsides, though, of going through the nipple. Nipple sensation can be diminished yes. a little bit. Uh, studies have shown slightly higher complication profile, though minuscule and certainly in, in series of just several thousand. So if you ask any surgeon in Manhattan anecdotally, they wouldn't be able to discern a difference between those two. But in huge data series with hundreds of thousands of implants, there is slightly lower complication rate okay. going through the fold. All right. 
Uh, there are some surgeons too. They like one as opposed to the other. I mean, the fold is definitely easier for the surgeon. There's yeah, no yeah, question yeah, yeah, yeah. about it. Access visibility uh, easier. What is this thing about? I would tell me about this, and I want to cut into that. Yeah. Uh, the this the, the the bra thing, the internal bras people are talking about. So uh, internal bras, or at least the term of internal bra, has become very popular. Yeah, I hear it all the time, and I'm not even sure I know what it is. Right. Uh, and I, in the last two years, have had an enormous number of women that have come into my office and been like, I want an internal bra. Yes. Well, why? Because, I mean, it sounds great, right. right? It sounds amazing. You're giving yourself support, right? It's, it sounds it's a amazing. perfect marketing name. It's It sounds amazing. And I, in fact, if you asked several facelift surgeons, they would tell you that five, eight years ago, people were talking about putting internal mesh Facial. supports into their face. Yeah. And, that really? sort of, and that sort of went away. Yeah. So basically what an internal bra is, it implies putting some type of material, usually a prosthetic mesh that is absorbable over 12 to 18 months into the breast to provide some temporary structure or scaffold uh, to, to hold and suspend the breast. Right. Now, it sounds amazing. The question is whether it actually works in practicality. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that in my practice, I use some type of mesh, quote unquote, internal bra support in almost all revisionary breast cases. Okay. However, in primary, meaning first time breast augmentation or breast lift with implant, I never use it. And I don't really, there, there's no good data in the plastic surgical literature to support its use. And I don't believe that it provides any significant benefit. In fact, can have some downside. Why do you think it could be a benefit in a revisional case? So in revisional cases, we're usually going back because there's either implant malposition, uh, some distortion of the breast, some asymmetry, and inserting an internal bra or some prosthetic scaffold can help you secure the implant in good position. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the marketing that an internal bra, everybody should have an internal bra because you'll never wear a bra again, it's just, it's just not true and not accurate. Risks of infection, foreign body stuff, these meshes are just hanging in. It's not an encapsulated thing. They can create other issues, right? Right. I mean, so you're already placing a foreign body. So we don't worry so much about placement of a foreign body, but sure, you're putting in a piece of mesh into the breast tissue. So first of all, it's, it's, and it's quite close to the incisions. So if you have a little incisional breakdown, yeah. suddenly you're looking at a piece of mesh, which can be- Is it complicated technically to, to put it in? You know, it's not a simple thing to put in, but- Seems simpler to put in yeah, it's the sim implant. It's simpler to put in an implant. The mesh has to be secured and properly positioned, but they can get infected they form scar tissue. Uh, it can again muddy the water for purposes of mammography and breast cancer screening. Yeah. And in many, in most cases, it's, it's just not not necessary. necessary. And it adds a lot of cost, a downtime, things like that. Agree. Yeah. Um, I assume also you because you do a lot of breast lifts. I've sent you. You do tummy tucks, a lot of body work yeah. in general. But I know when a lot of women go for breast lifts, they have this. They want their or they, or breast reduction. You know, they, they want their breasts smaller, but yet often they get recommended to put in implants. Tell me about this controversy that women, I'm sure you see this, right? I see this all the time. Uh, and as I'm sure in your practice, a lot of women seek multiple opinions and we encourage them to get yeah. multiple opinions yeah. from different doctors. My general feeling is if, if a woman has enough breast tissue to make a beautifully shaped breast, why would you want to remove breast tissue and replace it with an implant? Right. It does. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I mean, there are women that need implants because they have a paucity of breast tissue. Yeah. But the concept of removing or reducing the breast and replacing it with an implant to give yourself a rounder, larger breast doesn't make sense. Yeah. Sorry, it's not necessary. Definitely. Yeah. And w are there are there any is there any predictive value with because everyone's biggest fear with breast lifting surgery is to scar. And again, I'm doing this all day long for patients. And you know, like anything with scars, if you start. This is unfortunately this false belief going around um, from old plastic surgery adage that like, give it time, wait at least a year, let the scar develop. But certainly in the dermatologic literature over the last 20 years, scar treatment is all about get in early, do small things prophylactically, get more aggressive at if there's any issue. Is there any predictive value for patients uh, based on their physiology, whether someone's going to be a good scar or a bad scar? Because that lollipop, no one likes. Sure. I mean, you're probably better at telling this than I am. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm always amazed by people that come in and you tell them that you're going to either 
remove a lesion or do a breast lift yeah. and they're going to have a scar. And they're like, what do you mean? You're a plastic <laughs> surgeon. How, why am I going to have a scar? I thought I it was going to be invisible. And it, it can, listen, someone has a history of hypertrophic scars or key logs. You know that you're going to have to show a lot more precaution. But sometimes it's just plain surprising. Yes. There are some times I'm like, I cannot believe this thing is like practically invisible. And other times it could become like a roaring fire. Right. And, you know, listen, everything carries some degree of risk for people, right? 100%. Um, with breast lifts, is there a place, because, you know, a lot of times, again, with lipo, like before children, after children, is there a certain recommendation that you have for people? I know with tummy tucks, obviously, uh, you have certain recommendations, but how do you guide people on the journey? Should we go back to the scars for a sec? Oh, yeah, go back to scars. Uh, so when, when I address scars, I always say plastic surgeons were like tailors. The longer the scar, the longer the scene, the better the fit I can give you. Oh, that's interesting. So when people talk about, oh, can I have a minimally invasive breast Great lift? Great point. Uh, sure, but you're compromising on shape. Absolutely. Uh, at, like, it, like in every medical specialty. Yeah. So I always tell people, look, we, we have a scar treatment protocol that we're going to start in about three weeks. And in about four to six weeks, yeah. I get colleagues like you involved yeah. uh, and let you take it from there. Historical data I always find to be the best predictor of yeah. scarring. Somebody that I ask them, show me the scars that you have on your yeah, body. Yeah, yeah. How did they heal? Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I do is, and we spoke about this before, is setting expectations. So when I pull up my before and after gallery, I show them a really good scar. And you show them bad scar. And I say, this is a home run. And I show them a really bad scar. Really? And I tell them, most women, more than 80% will end up with a really good yeah, scar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two percent of women will end up with a really bad scar where you and I are yeah working working on it working. But the good news is it's very rare if the patient is compliant um, that they have to be left with something that makes them be at in the slightest bit regretful of doing whatever surgery that they did. I, I agree. You know, we see this with liposuction. People are like, "How many holes? How many holes?" And I always say, "It's about access." I would rather make ten teeny like pen size holes that I could fit a Q-tip through and be able to easily come from different angles to create the shape you want, then make two large holes and have to aggressively right. do things. And compromise. And on compromise the on the results. And I said, I got tons of tricks if there's any issues. And even though some people are left with a few marks, they are absolutely glad that they did the procedure. So let's go back to the portion about breast lifts before or after having babies. Is there any time where you recommend one or the over the other? So you see a lot of women in their late teens, early to mid twenties, uh, that are interested in having cosmetic breast surgery. I yeah. think that's a, that's a great time to do it. Yeah. Why? Because they they could have five, ten, fifteen years of enjoyment yeah. out of a fantastic result. Yeah. Before they start to bear children and breastfeed, uh, women that come in the midst of that time period where either they're planning on imminently having children or within the next year or two, oftentimes I will suggest to them that they wait. Why? Because it's unpredictable what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and then the vast majority of the women that we see for lifts, lifts with implants, uh, those are women that have completed having children. Yeah. And we know that whatever we do now uh, is going to have a fantastic result. In yeah. Run. And um, I wonder, you know, I, don't, I just thought of this too, because now we're dealing with a society where people are losing a lot of weight. It's absolutely affecting breast tissue. Do you come across people using the GLP-1 agonists who've lost a lot of weight? Uh, you know, the Ozempics and the Munjaros out there, how it affects how the tissue sits on implants and things like that. Tell me a little bit about that. For sure. I mean, in the last year, I think you and I and every other provider out there, we've seen a ton of body changes. Patients, body changes. Uh, I see them. I see body contour cases on after Ozempic or Munjaro more than ever. Yeah. The, it, it's interesting because those patients are prime for getting incredible results. Yeah. Right. Loose. There's just so much great work you can do on them. Yes. But there are a lot of other issues, and I've had some issues with nutrition, with suboptimal nutritional nutritional optimization. Yeah. Uh, some delayed wound healing because of poor protein intake, yeah. which I never had before. Really. Uh, so now we really focus. And you on can't that. go to sleep. Uh, right. You have to stop the medication. Correct. 
you have to stop it because it can create problems with anesthesia and uh, gastric emptying Correct. and things, aspiration, things of that nature. Right. So most people know that the night before surgery, you stop eating at midnight. Yeah. But there's a whole different protocol uh, for patients that are on these medications. You essentially have to stop the medication two weeks ahead of time, yeah. go on a liquid diet for 48 hours prior to the surgery, and then and then nothing to eat wow. from midnight. I think like with any new medication that's a big hurrah, there's, it's going to take several years to find that balance because- it, it, they are wonder wonder drugs for people that really need them, but they have a whole portion of society that's overshooting. And I do believe that there's there's something to be said evolutionary, like you know, being of a certain amount of thinness at fifty, um, you you can't be what you were at twenty. You can't have your high school weight. Right. At the, it just doesn't look good. It affects your bone density, your nutritional structure, all these different things. And there's huge amount of forget about for your health, but aesthetic issues also. I see a lot of women who are either naturally extremely thin, they're marathon runners, or they've been on Ozempic for aesthetic purposes. And they actually look older. I agree. And their body looks older. Their butts look older. Their breasts look older. Their skin is drier and all these things. And, you know, fat does hold some dramatic, you know, pe pe fat means bad in society. It actually holds some... Uh, medical and aesthetic value. For sure. And I think it affects the, the tummy tuck, the breast implant industry dramatically. I'm curious to see how it uh, how it all pans out. I mean, you asked me before, those are those are challenging breast cases. Yeah. Why? Because the skin laxity is so significant. And at the end of the day, if I'm putting in an implant, you do need good soft tissue envelope to hold that implant in, in a nice position. Yeah. Uh, so th those are challenging cases and we do a lot of them now. Yeah. Are there certain things that you want to see in the future? You know, let, let, let's say this, because I want to hear about the future. What is like one of the main things you've seen change technically, not in terms of perspective, but certain techniques or things that have changed um, since maybe you were in training? And then the next question is really going to be like, what do you want or foresee in the future? Because it's going to continue to evolve. Sure. Uh like you got to do something differently that you learned during training now, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, going back to what I said before, in the last 10 to 15 years, there have been remarkable improvements in the quality of breast In the quality. And in the variety. Yeah. And I think more now than ever, placing the implants and choosing the right implants has become as much an art as it was a science. Did you used to when you first learned? Like, did they always sit up the patient and try different implants? I mean, when I trained, like I mentioned before, you would open up a cabinet, you'd be like, oh, this woman looks like a 305 would be wow, a perfect for wow. And you would just open the box and put in a 305. There was not really much trialing. Uh, now we're so refined in it. I it's mean, much I, more I take custom. so many. I take so many measurements so the, in the consult, really, uh, which helps me differentiate between what projection, what width of the implant, etc. So I have a very good idea going into the OR. But a lot of those tweaking, a lot of that tweaking is done in the operating. How long is an average case? About an hour and a half of operating time, fifteen minutes to put you to sleep, fifteen minutes to wake you up. That's for pure augmentation. If we start adding a lift or doing a lift alone, lift with implant, et cetera, we're talking more like three hours. Three hours. I assume it gets longer than that sometimes too, right? I mean, there are cases, there are some women that you've sent me that have had implants five, six, seven times right. before. And Scar in those tissue. Cases, you and never know what you're going to find. You never know what you're going to find. It just makes it more complicated. I want to cut into these. Let's do it. Sure. You got a little scalpel there. Yeah, let's do it. So, so this, I'm, I'm glad we're doing this. Why? Because another incredible marketing, marketing term is a gummy bear. Everybody comes in and says, I yeah. want gummy bear implants. What is a gummy bear implant? Yeah. Pretty much what it means is if you cut this implant, you're going to have two halves. It is not liquid silicone like implants in the 1990s. That if a silicone implant ruptured, you would open up, it would drip on the floor. It would get absorbed into the lymphatics. People would present with uh, silicone granulomas yeah, yeah. in the armpits. <clears throat> These are highly cohesive implants. And this has been a, a big evolution in the last 10 to 15 years. As time has progressed, implants have become more cohesive. You want to do the honor? I'll let you do that. I really do, actually. I'll let I you, really, I'll let I you really do the do, honor. Because I do love silicone. So I, I would just cut a slit down the implant. So highly cohesive. Oh, my God. Right? I was expecting it to be drippy. No. So we call, oh these, we call these form stable implants, highly cohesive gels. Uh, just like when you talk about fillers and yeah. cross-linking, uh, 
These are highly cohesive implants. So why do we call them gummy bears? It's like cutting a gummy bear in half. You have, you have two two sides. I mean, if you ruptured, I mean, don't get me wrong, it create a mess, but it's certainly not like traveling to other parts of your body. No. Yeah. In fact, most most ruptures are so-called micro ruptures, meaning you get a small... Look, you, you stabbed the implant before, yeah. twice, before you cut the oh, slit, yeah. and nothing happened. So you can imagine if you if you cut a slit in the uh, in the shell, yeah. it stays the same way. And most people don't even know that they have a rupture. And it certainly doesn't migrate out of the breast into the lymphatics of the bloodstream. Interesting. Okay. And the last major question that I ask every you know expert in their field is, what is it that you kind of want to see in the future or you see as the direction of breast surgery? Look, I think the, in the last decade, we've had an enormous increase in the optionality, different types of implants, shape, sizes, viscosity, et cetera. It would always be nice to, in, to increase the duration of their life, yeah. lifespan. So, you know, if we can get to the point where implants last 20, 30, 40 years instead of 10 to 20 or 20 to 30, I mean, that would be an incredible change. It wouldn't be good for my practice, uh, but it would be an incredible You'll charge more on the initial Yeah, yeah we'll have to charge twice as yeah. much. And I assume with every new advancement, listen, there's a learning curve, right? You're constantly, the same thing in dermatology, but that's the fun part of what we do, right? Just being the best version of, of what we can do. Look, it's the same thing as fillers, right? We now have fillers that previously there were fillers that lasted three months. Now we've got fillers that last six to 12 months. Uh, yeah, they cost they cost more money. They cost more money. And by the way, and the same thing with this, longer is not always better. I mean, we've learned that the reactivity of these hyaluronic-based fillers, the higher the viscosity, the more the reactivity. There are also the less reversibility mm -hmm. you could have, but that's for a whole other episode with another derm that doesn't agree with me. But most importantly, uh, I actually learned a lot. It makes me interested in for myself. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you coming along. We've been working together a long time, and that ain't going to stop. I love it. All right, buddy. All right, I Paul, want thanks you a lot. To, I appreciate it. My pleasure. I want you to tell everybody in the audience how they could reach you. If they're not hearing you from my office, I want them to reach you directly. So we're here now in uh, Dr. Frank's West Village office, but I am not far from his Upper East Side, East 86th Street office, my office on the 89th and Park. Uh, best way to get in contact with us is either call the main desk, 212-920-6800. Check out our website, uh, drdrmaman.com. Uh, and we have hundreds of before and after galleries of every single shape uh, breasts you can imagine. And I'm sure you can find somebody that looks just like you on that you gallery. You got any uh, social media tag? We have a Maman Plastic Surgery. Maman Plastic on Instagram. Surgery. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Um, Season three, episode two, The Breast in Show with Dr. Dan Beaumont. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. 